Good morning and the warmest of welcomes to Claremont Parish Church Online, our service for the 22nd of November. My name's George Sneddon and I'm currently a minister in training based here at Claremont. Today I'll be joined by our minister Gordon Palmer who will lead us in God's word and also Valerie Stewart who will help us along with our Bible readings and then later we'll hear from Stephen Hay who will be leading us in our prayer for others. As we begin our worship service we hear from the Psalms. The Psalmist says ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Let's sing to God's praise in our first hymn, All Praise to Thee. going to spend time in some prayer and after which we'll recite the Lord's Prayer together and the version we use here at Claremont will appear on your screens. Let's pray together. Gracious God, how are we to do your will today? Will it be in our acts of praise, in our words we share, in our prayers we will lift? How will you lead us to serve? Help us trust you and help us listen. And Lord, we ask you to bless this time together as we join from different places and perhaps at different times, gathering our hearts in worship. 
encourage us, comfort us, unite us, and make our joy complete. Lord, even though we seek with all of our heart to be your people, we know that there are times when we ourselves have grown weary. Circumstances which have caused us to complain and question when we've put you to the test. Lord, we think about the times when our mouths have said yes and our deeds have said no. When we've wandered off your path, when we've failed to follow through on our promises. When we've been distracted by trivial things. Heavenly Father, call us back to you. As we worship you, empty our hearts of pride and arrogance. Empty our souls of greed and selfishness and empty our minds of doubt, mistrust and envy. As we will hear that you've poured out your very self through your son. Pour out your spirit into our hearts this morning. And reclaim us with your love. Hear our prayers, O God. As we gather them up in the words that your son taught us to say. Our Father in heaven. <coughs> As we continue our series in Paul's letter to the Philippians, we'll be reading chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Let's hear the word of God. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who, by being very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen and may God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Today's reading is from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. The request of James and John. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he said, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am ba baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. 
but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great amongst you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. Am I not sure if it's as um, bad now as it was, but at, at one time certainly, um, the question in the west of Scotland where, where we are, the question, where did you go to school? Well, it wasn't exactly an innocent question. Um, it wasn't always a, showing a great concern for your um, educational experience. Quite often it was an attempt to work out who you were, what tribe, what, what sect or sectarianism you, you belonged to. Were you with us or were you with them? Sometimes that was all that somebody wanted to know or somebody, all that somebody felt they needed to know. What school did you go to? We'd tell them everything. Um, many others didn't look at it as, as, as badly as, as that and as seriously as that. But for all of us, we are all influenced by, affected by where we came from. We're all influenced by and affected by our, our beginnings and our, and our roots. And that's true of Jesus of Nazareth as well. Oh, I don't mean what it was like in Nazareth. I don't even mean what it was like in, in um, Bethlehem where he was born. And I don't mean, um, you know, the, the influence of his big cousin, John the Baptist, taking him into, into public ministry. No, from Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, Jesus being in the very nature God. That is, his divinity, his godness wasn't, wasn't second-hand. It wasn't something passed on to him. Sometimes at night time you look out in the sky and you see the, the moon shining, but the moon's not really got any light of its own. What the moon's doing is reflecting sunlight. But that's not about what Jesus was doing. He wasn't reflecting Godness. He wasn't reflecting the Father's glory. glory. He, verse 6 of Philippians 2, was very, in the very nature, he was God. He was every bit as much divine as a father. He didn't have to go on a course so that he could learn some godliness. He didn't have to do a, a probationary period to see if his divinity was up, up to it. No, he was very nature God, Philippians 2.6. It's a bit crude, I, I know, but suppose we could draw a line and at the one side of the line have creator and at the other side of the line have creation and creatures. Jesus is very definitely on the creator side. John's gospel in its very first verse tells us, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the rest of that chapter goes on to tell us a bit more about this Word and how He came in the flesh and how He was Jesus. But in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the very nature of God. And then remember that. Think of that great claim. And then let us go and, and look at the nativity scene. Nativity scenes, I suppose, will be sprouting up uh, um, all over the place in the next wee while. Go, go to that nativity scene and look in. What do you see in the manger? Not a wee baby with that little golden halo glow thing around its head that you get in some Christmas cards. No, no, Jesus didn't look like that. What you would see is just a little, weak, fragile, helpless baby. One who cannot get any comfort for himself. One who cannot speak, can only cry. He needs his mother's arms and his mother's breast to reassure him. And then hang around for a bit longer and you'll probably see Mary having to wipe away some sick and then do whatever was the first century equivalent of a nappy change. And then stick around a wee bit longer after that and you'll see Mary and Joseph up half the night trying to get him to sleep. 
as this baby was as restless and as unsettled as all the other babies. And all the while, that baby, that weak, helpless, crying out for mother's milk, dirtying nappies, baby is the very nature God. As one of our Christmas carols puts it, low within the manger lies, he who built the starry skies. And, and that's the astonishing claim of Christmas. That's the astonishing claim about the birth of Jesus, that while still being in the very nature God, not reflecting something God from somewhere or something else, but being in the very nature of God, he was at the same time still one of us and had united himself to us in all our weakness and fragility. And that verse in Philippians chapter 2, at verse 6, goes on to say that Jesus didn't do that for his own sake. He did not consider with equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He didn't need to shore himself up. There was, he was already perfect. He was without need, not dependent on anything or anyone else. And Jesus didn't use that godness to suit himself. He didn't look at his dinner plate and then think, oh, a wee bit hungrier tonight, I'll just put a wee bit more, magic up a wee bit more onto the plate. He didn't put back together things that he'd maybe broken. Jesus' encounters with, with Satan in the wilderness, and we're told about them in Matthew 4 and, and in Luke 4. When Jesus encountered Satan and was tempted, he resisted, and, and in resisting, he's saying he was not going to use his power for self-advantage. He was not going to turn stone into bread. He wasn't going to use his power to make a big show that would have people going, wow. He wasn't going to do that. I wonder, I wonder if you and I would be able to hold ourselves in check like that. I wonder if we, if we were in very nature God and had that kind of power. You know, would we maybe put a few extra chips on the plate? Would we maybe rescue the dinner that we had burnt and undo that and, and make it fine? If we were sending somebody a birthday card and we knew it was going to arrive a day late, would we somehow speed up the process to get that card there in time? You know, what harm would it do? We've still paid for the stamp. You know, who's going to be put out here? But the thing is, Jesus didn't. Jesus didn't use his power for his own advantage. I couldn't be sure that I would never do anything like that. I couldn't be sure that I wouldn't sort of want to cut a corner or three or four or five. And of course, once you've done it once, it's so much easier to do it again and again and again. Jesus didn't. Well, being in the very nature of God, he did not use that for his own advantage. Instead, we're told, verse 7, he became a servant. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. And notice that. Verse 6, very nature God. Verse 7, very nature servant. His serving was just as real, just as much part of him as his being God. Serving others was not some kind of act that Jesus put on. He was not thinking, you know, if I, if I you know, serve somebody here, I'm going, it's going to make a good impression. He was not doing it just as some demonstration for us to copy, although he did want us to do that, and we'll come back to that. And indeed, we were partly looking at that last week when George was speaking to us. But here, instead of grasping, we're told, Jesus, let's go. Instead of tightening his grip and all the advantages of being God, he emptied himself. Instead of pulling his majesty tightly around himself, he took off his glory and became a servant. Nobody would be able to stop him doing as he pleased, but he was more interested in serving. 
And he didn't do that just from time to time or when there was nothing to, to lose. He didn't just serve when he well, wasn't too tired and when he, or when he knew it would be appreciated or when he knew there would be a favor or two that he could call in. It wasn't anything calculated like that. It wasn't anything with an ulterior motive. It was not something half-hearted. It was servanthood, verse 7 of Philippians 2, in its very nature. Now, as he said in the passage in Matthew, uh, Mark that Valerie read to us, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. And that way of living that, of, that we're more familiar with about trying to get things for ourselves and so on, Jesus spoke about that in that passage in Mark with his disciples and said, you're not to be like that. That way of trying to make yourself important, that way of counting yourself as better, of making yourself seem more significant, that, that way of getting perks and getting influence so that you can get people to do what you would like them to do and so, so on. Jesus turned all of that on its head. But notice, he was not just contrasting his way and this other way of grabbing power. He was undoing the very sin of humanity. Back in the opening chapters in Genesis, when Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, they did grasp. They gave in to the lie of Satan, you know, who said to them, verse 5 in Genesis 3, go on, eat of that tree. God said not to do it just because you're going to be equal with him when you do it. Go on, help yourself. Ah, been equal with God. Hmm. Quite fancy. Do you not fancy that, Eve? I quite fancy that. And they take and they grasp. In contrast, we're being told Jesus laid aside. They wanted to get equal with God, but we're told that Jesus, although he had equality with God, verse 6, he didn't say he was going to use it for himself, but emptied himself and took the form of a servant. Here is Jesus undoing not just the penalty of sin, but also the way of sin. As the Son of God, and who is God in his very nature, takes on servanthood in his very nature and says, this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're to be. Two things, two things in conclusion. One, we're going to finish um, the service later on this morning. We're going to finish our service with a hymn, Meekness and Majesty with its declaration of how Jesus combined both meekness and majesty, the very nature of God and the very nature of servanthood. And that hymn finishes with a declaration. It finishes with the acclaim saying, this is our God. So then is it? Are you stunned time and again by the realization that this is who our God is? Does that stop you ever in your tracks? If not, why not? Well, he might, he might leave um, Barcelona at the end of this season, we're told, but su suppose Lionel Messi does that and then signs for Isco Bride and playing his football next year up at the K Park. Everyone will be stunned. What's going on? Why has he done that? He could have gone this place. He could have gone that way. He could be making this money. He could be making that money. What's he doing? Well, that's nothing compared with what Jesus did. Though he was in the very nature of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. But instead, he emptied himself and took the nature of a servant. We don't understand that fully. We don't understand that completely. Of course we don't. But if anyone's a Christian, they'll understand it enough to go, what? Really? And not just do that at the time when we become Christians, but there'll be times just as we go through life and reflect on who this is. This is our God. And so one of the key marks of the Christian life then is that the gospel will really gobsmack you. And the gospel which gobsmacks you will leave you in the place of saying thank you and, and living a life out of gratitude. 
so that the Christian life doesn't become something of rules to keep, something you must try harder and do better. Rather, it's a life lived in thankfulness and gratitude to God who did that for us. Well, that's firstly, meekness and majesty, being wowed by the gospel. Secondly, then, is the question, will we then join Jesus in this way of being, this way of living? He did give it to us as an example. This is what kingdom life and kingdom living will look like in the kingdom of God. What it means to be a follower, a disciple, is to go the way of Jesus, to take up the cross and follow. And Jesus showed himself to be God, not just when he was healing lepers, not just when he was feeding thousands with a few loaves and fish. Jesus was showing himself to be God when he stooped and served. When he said to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. When he picked up the fallen, when he gave encouragement to the discouraged, when he he went to the house of the incredibly unpopular Zacchaeus and, and had dinner with him. Jesus was being God in all those ways too. The world has seen too much of the grasping, grabbing way that Jesus talks about in Mark 10 at 41 and 42. And very sadly, we have to say that far too often the church has been complicit in that, taking power, wanting a seat at the top table and and so on. But it's not the way of Jesus There is no saviour, there is no messiah other than the one who rebuked James and John, Mark 10, and then who summed up his purpose as not being served, but serving. There is no other Jesus than that one who said he was giving his life as a ransom for others. And so if we want to receive the forgiveness from sin, if we want to receive what Jesus longs to give us, then we have no choice but to follow. There is no other Jesus other than that one who was in his very nature God and then in very nature became a servant. This is our God. Make sure it's yours. It's not enough just to smile on from a distance as we hear a nice wee story about a child being born, about some shepherds and wise travelers turning up. That baby grew up and said, if you want to follow me, take up my cross daily and follow. Let us pray. Gracious God, we don't easily or normally find meekness and majesty coming together. We don't find readily that combination of being God and being a servant, of being great and yet embracing weakness. And yet here is the way that you come to us. Coming to us in a way that we'd be able to take in, that we would be able to understand as you got down on the floor and played with us and spoke to us in our our baby tongue, as it were. And you did that in order to be able to pick us up and take us right into the heart of God himself. Lord, help us never to say, oh yeah, I know that story. I know the details, or I know the formula, God becoming human, and so on. Rather, might it continually thrill us, excite us, move us, challenge us, and, 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 and send us into lives of gratitude that you did that for us. And help us, too, to go the way of such a Savior, of such a Messiah, May our deepest desire not be to not be to be served, 
but rather to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're going to <coughs> sing a hymn that speaks to us of that humility of Christ. My Lord, you wore no royal crown. After we've sung that hymn, we'll confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and then Stephen Hay will be leading us in our prayers for others. I believe in the Lord, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, our only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in his grave. He descended into the grave. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father.
Before we come to today's prayer for intercession, I thought I'd share a poem that popped up in my Facebook feed that I think um, was quite apt considering what was said last week in the sermon and what is likely to be said today. Sometimes I retreat from you when everything is in its place. I forget the words you've said to me, even though they stare me in the face. I claim that my success was created by my hands. I forget the hands that were pierced by nails is the reason success withstands. When anxiety overtakes me and darkness overcomes, I forget that God has promised eternity to all of his little ones. Now as we come to the prayer for intercession, um, I'd like to do this as a responsive prayer. So during this you'll hear me say quite a few times, Lord in your mercy. And if we could each say in our own homes, hear our prayer, we we'll participate in this. So let us pray. Trusting in God's care for his children, we pray in the name of Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. For those who are sick, Lord, your steadfast love extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. We pray for those who are unwell due to the coronavirus. In your compassion, grant them strength and healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our health workers, in the day of trouble you answer us and you protect us. You send us help and give us support. We pray for all who minister to the sick throughout our health service that they may renew their strength in you and be channels of restoration and renewal for those who suffer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the anxious, you are near to the brokenhearted and you save the crushed in spirit. We pray for all who are anxious about loved ones, friends and neighbours. Enable them to trust in you and be steadfast in hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the lonely and isolated, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. We pray for those who feel isolated or alone, that they may experience your loving presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the strong and the vulnerable, Lord, you raise the poor and lift the needy. We pray that you would inspire those who are strong to care for the vulnerable and to serve them in love. May they be humble, not thinking of themselves as better than others. May they act not only for their own interests, but take an interest in others too. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the church, how can we sing your song, O Lord, in these strange times? We pray for your church, who longs to praise you throughout this strange and confusing time. Through your creative spirit, fire our imaginations to proclaim your unchanging love in new ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those in authority, we cast our burden upon you, O Lord, and you sustain us. We pray for all in authority who face difficult decisions that affect the lives of many. Grant them wisdom and courage. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those engaged in research, Lord, you are a great and abundant power. Your understanding is beyond measure. We pray for all engaged in research who are seeking to develop, to develop a vaccine and remedies for coronavirus. Grant them wisdom, understanding and effectiveness in their endeavours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For employers and employees, you are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? You are the stronghold of our life. Of whom shall we be afraid? We pray for employers and employees who are fearful for the future, that businesses may be secured, jobs protected, and family supported. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who face hardship, the eyes of all look to you and you give them food in due season. We pray for all those facing financial hardship that you would support and sustain them. We remember all those who seek to fulfil Christ's command to love one another and this can happen through the work of food banks and charities and also through acts of simple kindness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those in education, Lord, you give strength to your people and you bless them with peace. We pray for all in education at this uncertain time. Inspire those who feel bored or directionless. Protect the vulnerable and give fresh hope to the dismayed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
for the departed. Lord, you show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. With sadness, we remember those who have lost their lives due to coronavirus. Give us thankful hearts for the privilege of knowing them and strengthen our faith in your Son who died for us and rose again in glory that we might share in his victorious life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the grieving, God, for you alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from you. You alone are my rock, my salvation and my fortress. We pray for those who weep and mourn, that they may find comfort and hope in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of life, in this time of crisis for our families and communities, our nation and our world, we turn to you in faith to seek your guidance and receive your blessing, knowing that nothing in all creation can separate us from your love made known to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask this in the name of Jesus who took our infirmities and bore our diseases, who suffered on the cross and rose again triumphant, for he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever and always one, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit in a world without end. Amen. Well, and just before we sing that closing hymn, Meekness and Majesty, that I mentioned earlier, just a reminder for folks that um, the funeral service for Linda McDade will be uh, this coming Thursday, the 26th November at 11 o'clock at South Lanarkshire Crematorium. But that beforehand, um, the funeral cortege will be visiting and driving around the park, car park outside at Clermont, round about 25 to um, um, 11 for, for that. So um, if anyone wants to um, come and pay respects in that way, you may, you may do so. The funeral service is being live streamed and there is details of that um, in our usual midweek messenger and usual places. If you do want to um, watch the service and haven't been able to track down the links, then contact the church office. We didn't put out a new Clement Calling this week, but refer you back to last week's with its appeal for, for help and various things as we um, move in towards what we are planning for Christmas and doing. In particular, we're still looking um, for a few folks with, with windows. If you've got a window, I'm um, looking for a few folks with windows to be part of our Advent window display. Um, and if you can help out with that, then do contact the, the church office as soon as possible. And also, we are um, handing it, going to be handing out some Christmas gift bags. There's information about that. As I say, last week's Claremont Calling, also in the most recent um, Midweek Messenger, and again, it will be um, there this Wednesday of all the details of the things that we need, we need help with. Do um, um, support us and join with us in seeking to be a witness to Jesus and seeking to bless others in the neighbourhood. Our closing praise, meekness and majesty.
grace of a 